uh, thank you very much, but it's, it's really not trivia, it's big. African thinking, African philosophy is a big thing. But Africans think and Africans do in a different way. They create art, they create philosophy, they create art more monumental than Michelangelo, and they never sign their name. Because they live in a society that is collective, while the Europeans live in a society that is individual. That is why you are trapped in this society. They live in a we society, and Europeans live in a me society. It's a different kind of concept. The Africans live for the totality, the collectiveness of the whole society. And the Europeans live for the meanness of the individual in the society. This is why every time you see a piece of European art, you see somebody's name under it. And yet the Benin art of Africa is nobody's name. Who created the Benin, the Benin art? The great art of Egypt, the great river art of the Niger, the, the, the uh, uh, art of Nigeria, all this art. This, this art is as good and sometimes better than the best of Europe. And yet the artist did not even sign his name. Because the art was created for the whole people. And when you see the folk philosophy, the philosophy, the, the, the folklore, the folklore and the folk tales of Africa, all of these things are told and put down not for individuals, but for an entire people. What I like to quote is an African proverb that says that a man that, that if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. <laughs> I will never know what African said it, but I know an African said it. <laughs> now, the discussion for tonight is Africa time of trouble, the coming of the Europeans. Very few people just talk about this subject from an African point of view because the coming of the Europeans not only to Africa but the coming of the Europeans to the world was disaster. And yet when you read the history books the assumption is that the coming of the Europeans was the bringing of the light. And yet everywhere he went in the world he put out the light. He brought no civilization to anybody, anywhere, any place in the world. Now I am reversing history, and if I couldn't prove it, I wouldn't be saying it. The first place, you have to deal with something in one of the great myths in human history, and that is the myth of the invader as civilizer and conqueror. No people ever conquered and invaded any people for the sake of civilizing them. This is true. This is even true when blacks are invading blacks. This is true across the board. This is true every time in history. Now I can point to what seemed to be an exception and if you bend history a little bit you can make it an exception. But you'll be making it an exception but if you look well there's not an exception at all. When the Kushites 
invaded Egypt and created the mighty 25th dynasty, they improved Egypt. They put Egypt's house in order and they gave Egypt her last walk in the sun. Here was a case where the invader did some good. Does that prove me wrong? No. I still maintain that the invader always does more harm than good. And what am I talking about in this case? The invasion was not really an invasion in the true sense. The Kushites from the south were relatives of the, of the Egyptians. They were African relatives invading the house of the relative and telling the relative, put your house in order before the foreigners come back here and take over both of us. So it was not an invasion in the true sense because those in the South were just as much of the North as the others. And when they invaded, the the question of the three great generals that invaded Castor, Pianchi, Tahaka was, are you obeying the old religion? Are you true to the great re religions of the river? And they asked them, are you obeying the laws and the moral laws laid down by the last great goddess of the Nile Valley, the woman goddess, Maya. Are you true to her teachings? And when you look today and see all the people hung up called women's live, these black men, 751 BC, Asking other black people, are you obeying the moral laws laid down by a woman? This will blow the white people's mind. Today, how about women's white equality? When these people wanted to know whether you obeying a black woman who was a god. And they worried about whether they should elect a white woman as the executive. They're talking about equality. And they were talking about gods. <laughs> These people are so far behind us. <laughs> Even a pity. Now, when you analyze what I'm talking about, I've showed you an exception. But when you analyze it, it wasn't an invasion at all. Just one relative trying to put another relative's house in order because it wasn't an invasion at all because the south and the north was one and the same. I can show you another example outside of Egypt. The African invasion of Spain. The Africans, Berbers and Arabs gave Spain the greatest material civilization it ever had before or since. Yet, the Africans, Berbers, and Arabs so depressed Iberian or Spanish culture to the point it hasn't recovered to this very day. If you go to Spain right now, when they point to some achievement, it is some achievement the Moors left behind. They still hadn't recovered. I say every invader depresses the culture of a people and takes more away, ultimately, than they gave. I'm talking about the Europeans coming to the world doing the whole world more harm than good. And if he say he is the bringer of the light, 
he is a liar and a hypocrite because he brought no light, he put out the light. And that he is in a position right now of losing the world and each time he called an age, his golden age, is that age when he has somebody else to exploit outside of Europe. And that he never had a golden age when he had only Europe to feed on. He is being pushed right now to a point where he is being deprived of the land and the resources outside of Europe when he would rather blow up the world if he can't rule it. And so the people of the world had better protect themselves or prepare to go back in chain. Because he'd rather enslave it or destroy it if he can't rule it. All right, now, let us look at the world of Africa and Asia, but principally Africa, before that European came out of that box the second time. <laughs> All right, the first time he was pushed back into Europe by a combination of Africans and Arabs after he had played around with Christianity, disgraced it, brought on Islam, was pushed out of the Mediterranean. All right. During these years, he is out of the Mediterranean. He was forced into what he called the middle of the dark ages. For 700 years now, he's been in Europe, feeding on Europeans. He has not enslaved the African, principally because he has been enslaving Europeans under a form of slavery that he called feudalism. Strong Europeans have taken the land and enslaved other Europeans to work the land. The biggest landowner in Europe is the church. The church has the exploitation of the people under the guise of divine right of the church. And the church has calmed down the people. Talk about the Catholic Church, it's the only church they recognized at that time. That the people are going to get their house in the hereafter. The people are, it, are so burdened with taxation and that the people are about to explode. Now, to get more funds to build the cathedrals and to support the top heavy ministry, the gold lace robes of the priests and the bishops, they are selling compensations to the people. Then they have to look around for different ways to make money from the people. And so now they have something laying in wait, they haven't exploited, something called pregatory. <laughs> And so they began to exploit the concept of purgatory. So, all right, grandma died. The poor soul didn't get to heaven. She stopped in purgatory. For so much money and so many prayers, 
we will pray her from purgatory into hell. <laughs> So now you begin to fork out some money to get grandma from purgatory into hell. That's another way of milking the people. So in the midst of this, they got a little, quite a bit of money that way. Then they begin to sell compensations and favors and tassels. The more tassels you got, the closer you are to God. And the church fakers began to, you know, you're selling all kind of forgiven toys. And in the midst of all of this, the people began to grumble. They've got nothing left. The church is bleeding them dry. The people are about to explode against the church. Then something came, save the church, save the church. In the nick of time, a beatnik religious wanderer, Peter the Hermit, had gone to the Holy Land and discovered something. A puritanical Arab, a Persian, he said he was a Persian, so if he says it's a Persian, we never argue that point. Saladin had barred the Christian pilgrimage from going to the Holy Land to see the Holy Grail and the Holy Places. He spread the news across Europe. How dare this infidel keep us from the Holy Places to see the ornamentations, the chalice, and all of the things that touched by our Lord, including the very shawl that he died in. He spread the news across Europe. We must go and rescue the Holy Grail. Wasn't lost anyway, but that be that as it were. So the Pope sees the idea. Now he can take the people's tension off of revolt. He needs an issue to take the people's mind from what the church has been doing to them. Now, you think because of your books that the crusade has something to do with holiness, something to do with religion. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but the crusade was a political thing to save the church from the wrath of the people. <laughs> now, you can read it your way, but as a classroom teacher, I got to read it the truthful way. The way they, the way they, all right. Now, Peter the Hermit, and the, with the Pope's endorsement, people began to gather for the first crusade. People began to march, and as they began to march to gather food, gather people to go across Europe, Rescue the Holy Grail, rescue the ornamentations from the infidels. People forgot their grievances. And as they began to march across Europe, they could take, go to a farm and not only take the farmer's products, take the farmer's daughter in the name of God. One of us, a woman over 10, say, take the lady too. What an unviolated woman in root. They could do everything. They said, in the name of God, come on, in the name of God, give it up. They just marched across, just taking everything inside. All right, now, at first crusade, although Cecil B. DeMille has given you one crusade, <laughs> and made a fortune and died. <laughs> I know I've given you one that Cecil B. DeMille didn't give you in the movie. In the movie, they won 
In real life, they got hell beat out of them. <laughs> now, Richard the Lionhearted did not go on the first crusade. Because Cecil Mead the Mill got him on the first crusade. In real life, he went on the second crusade. In, in, in uh, Cecil B. the Mill's version, he was a Christian. In real life, he was an Edward. In real life, he was, he, he didn't even belong to the church. Of, he belonged to the Church of England superficially, but never went to church. Because he was, he, the Church of England wasn't even crystallized at the time. He went through the motions. But in real life, the real reason for him going to the church, going on the crusades, that they had a, some foreign prince, princess for him to marry, who didn't attract him. She didn't have much behind or in front. <laughs> Flat both ways. So, um, he wanted to get out of that marriage. <laughs> I guess the best way for him to put some space between him and the lady. <laughs> he, he decided he wanted to go. <laughs> so he, I don't know what made him so lion-hearted, he couldn't stand up. <laughs> so he, he got, got out of England <laughs> to get out of that marriage. <laughs> So he was going as long as he could, um, and um, as they moved across Europe. But fortunately, his crusade happened to be one of the larger, the larger crusades. And they had a moderate success on the crusades. But another thing that happened on the crusades, some of the common people went on the crusades, and as they met defeat, the common people saw something that gave them courage. They saw the lords being defeated, begging the infidel Turks and the infidel Arabs for mercy. They understood that these were human beings and not gods. When these men would get back to their respective countries, they would let this be known. And so, they would now demand some basic human rights and some basic decency for themselves. and would not be kicked around like dogs because they were treated worse than dogs when they left. Now, while the old lords were away during the crusades, the young lords gave up and a privilege that the old lords were trying to hold on to. And that is the right of first night. If you were a serf on my land and you married, I had the right to spend the first night with your wife. The young lords gave up that right while the old laws were away without the old laws permission. And they couldn't take it back when they got back. It don't sound like a big deal, but it was a big deal for them. The fact that these young arrogant lords had given up their privilege, their privilege to sleep with the same wife the first night of the marriage. So now this is, this is a major reform in the living conditions of the serf. These were white slaves, white slaves to whites. What I'm trying to show you is that the 300 year making of the mentality of the European that ultimately gonna go into the enslavement of the blacks. What the blacks failed to understand is that the European mentality that enslaved us, that is still intact, was a long time in the making. And once it was crystallized, it was there to stay. 
And I call this the evil genius of Europe. And you've got to understand that mentality. Because black people are hung up with the concept. They are human beings just like us. You are not. They are not. They are human beings shaped by a condition of history. When you are human beings shaped by a condition of history, and you are shaped by an environmental condition and by a cultural condition. And if you understand something which I've gone over repeatedly, but I still think you missed the point, that all of us are shaped by three meanings of history. The people of the sand, the people of the sun, and the people of the ice. The Europeans are still the people of the ice to this day. The Africans are still the people of the sun to this day. The Arabs are still the people of the sand to this day. And each one of us act according to the environment that produced us. And you still act with the sentiment and the beautiful humanity that came out of that sun. And maybe we have spent too much time expecting the sun in the sand, in the ice, to get together. We should let each one fall in its respective place and stay there. And when Marcus Garvey said, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad, he might have just had the point. Asia for the Asian, Europe for the Europeans, Africa for the Africans, and let it be. Now, there was a time when each emperor with enough power who wanted to impress the Pope found his own crusades. But this petered out until a group of children in Europe decided that if the adults have failed, we will go and rescue the Holy Grail. We will go across Europe and do what they failed to do. And this is the last and the most tragic of all of the crusades, the children's crusade. The most tragic crusade in history. A quarter of a million, children, maybe a little more, marched across Europe. These kids were sincere, dedicated Christian children, marched across Europe saying that they would go and rescue the Christian ornamentations in the holy places. Adults integrated themselves with the kids ostensibly to help them. But half of them froze to death, died of hunger, and when they got to the warm waters of the Mediterranean in the spring, they discovered that the adults came in to help them were really slave traders who sold the rest to the infidel Arabs that they were supposed to be fighting. One of the tragic events in human history. Now if the African understood that event, if the Africans had insight and understood what the Europeans were doing to the Europeans, he could have saved himself from the slave trade. So if these people would do that to their children, there's nothing for me to expect. 
And when the European hit his shore, he'd have killed them on sight. That'd have been the end of that. He wasn't loaded to it. He was still hung up with the fact that if I have humanity, somebody else come, I have, I, I'll treat him like he's a human being because I'm a human being. He invited him for dinner. Treat him like a guest. He ended up being a slave. That same kind of sentiment is still among African people to this very day. Still naive, that naivete about the gas. The Aztecs in Mexico did the same thing with Cortez and he took over Mexico. Less than 2,000 men took over all Mexico. Came as the guest, stayed as the conqueror. We non-Western people never learned. Had learned to this very day. All right, now, Europe is awakening from the Middle Ages and from the Dark Ages. The Africans are still ruling Spain. Still, they still blocked Europe from the Mediterranean. And yet, the storm is gathering in Spain between two sets of Africans. And this storm is gathering because the Muslims are beginning to fight among themselves. Portugal frees herself from the domination of the Africans in 1240 because the Africans were the military arm of Spain from 711 to 1240 because around 1000 the Almoravides under Ibn bin Tishfan enters the scene. Mostly Africans, sprinkling of Arabs. But 12, in the 10 hundreds, but 1240, the Almohades enters. Now you have two competing military groups for the Mediterranean in Spain. In the 1400s, they begin to argue among themselves. The Almoravis are puritanical Muslims. The Almohades are mixed with the second Arab invaders who came in from Arabia in the 10 hundreds. They don't care too much about Islam. They're pretending Islam. That was the dumping ground, the, the waste matter of the Arab world. They're free booters, marauders, and nobodies. They come in looking for what they could get. Now, the argument is over customs of Islam. That group goes into Spain and violates all the basic rules of the faith. They not only marry Spanish women, they marry more than four. A violation of the faith, violation of the custom. They not only marry more than four, they let the Spanish woman remain in the Catholic Church. If she's good and better, they don't care what she whether she stay in the church or not. But the African not only doesn't marry more than four, but whoever he marries, she has to not only convert to Islam, she must keep a proper Islamic diet. <clears throat> Failing that, he goes home to Africa get his woman. There was no Catholic woman in his bed, no, no, was no Catholic woman in his kitchen. He's, he's, he's a Muslim straight away. Because we, when we get into a, a thing, we go all the way. We out poke the pope and out Mamma Mamma. You either do it right or don't do it. <laughs> now, the argument now 
love between these factions. You got Islamic factions arguing. Now, about 1450, this argument is getting heated to the point where one half of Spain under the Castilians have freed themselves from the domination. The Castilians boast that they have no Moorish blood. It's a lie, but that's what they say. Because the Spaniards have been mixed with African blood even since the Carthaginian time. Because any time the Spaniards say he's pure white, I mean, don't ever laugh directly in his face. I mean, be respectful. I mean, cup your hands and turn your head to one side. <laughs> They've been mixed with us so long. <laughs> it's just impossible to find a single Spanish on the face of the earth who don't have at least a few drops of us. They used to boast about it, but now in this country, you know, when, if they can pass the taxi cab test, they try to pass <laughs> the color test. <laughs> don't argue the point, you know. If you can pass it, pass. All right, good luck, good, good luck. And <laughs> don't make no fuss about it. All right, now, there was something else that happened early, earlier. 1415, the Portuguese, who are in the, more independent than the Spaniards, still partly under the domination of the Moors, 1415, the Portuguese invade a part of Africa, a little enclave called Cetra. I used to say it's about the size of Central Park, but then I went to Cetra. It's off the coast of Morocco. It's not as big as Central Park. <laughs> and they conquered it. And this put heart in, in Europe. It's been years since the Europeans been able to join the blood in Africa. Africa had caused them so much fear. And Europeans now begin to get that little courage back again. See, almost 700 years or more, the Africans had pinned them in into the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean was the sea, the sea of the world, the trading sea. Since the days of the Carthaginians, they wanted that sea. Remember during the Roman time, Carthage, when Hannibal blocked their way off, and when they shouted out, Carthage must be destroyed. They just had to have the Mediterranean. They've got to have it right now. It touches on three great cultures. It was the melting pot, the cultural melting pot of the world. They wanted it back again. They wanted to get back into the Mediterranean, back into the trade of the Mediterranean. All right, 1455, we have to go slow right here because something is going to happen, 1455. Spain and Portugal now free enough, free enough now to go to the Pope and begin to talk about, we're going to take over the world next. They're so sure of themselves, they're talking about lines of demarcation. Go to the Pope, talking about how we're going to divide up things when we're in charge. In this ensuing conversation before the Pope, the Pope sells the argument. You are both authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel people. This account is beautifully told in Eric Williams' 
capitalism and slavery. And told again in his work, um, the Caribbeans from Columbus to Castro. I don't know what you think about Eric Williams. A whole lot of people didn't think too much of him as the Prime Minister of Trinidad. And a whole lot of people don't forget that Eric Williams, while he may not have been a good Prime Minister of Trinidad, he was one of the best historians that ever come out of the Caribbean Islands. <laughs> I knew him personally, and he was a colleague of mine, and knew him enough to fight with him and argue with him and to do with him. That man knew research. That man knew history. He should never have been a prime minister, because that's my personal opinion. Because I just happen to think that he was out of place as a politician. He should have been in the classroom. He could do more research faster and get more things correctly placed than any, any, any historian I know about. He wrote the history of Trinidad and Tobago in two months. And, did, and, and, and there wasn't a single error in it. <laughs> Some writers take three years to do a book like that. It's insight into it. And while in his last years he wanted to ban his own book, Capitalism and Slavery, I still think it was, in fact, he, he wanted to put you in jail for bringing it into Trinidad. I still think it's one of the great masterpieces of economic history. Right, my, my main point here is that the Pope had literally sanctioned the mentality that would go into the making of the slave trade. Now, as we move further, something else is going to happen. These are unnoticed events in history. The maps of the Jewish gold merchants who had a monopoly on gold trade in North Africa and in inner Africa called the Western Sudan would fall into the hands of Prince Henry of Portugal called Henry the Navigator though there is no evidence that he ever went to sea. <laughs> he would open a school for chart making and map making. The important thing about the school is that a little known sailor, Christopher Colon, later called Christopher Columbus, would attend this school. More about him later. <laughs> All right, now. Now Europe is learning longitude and latitude. Europe has forgotten how to handle ships. The school at Salamanca, run by Africans and Arabs, had began to translate this information from Spain, from, from in, in Spain, translate this information from the leading maritime nation of that day, which is China. Now, taking the material from China, Europe is going back at sea, but Europe is learning something else. Europe is learning intellectual history also preserved at Salamanca. Europe has forgotten its own masters. It's forgotten its philosophers, Aristotle and Plato and all of this has been forgotten. Europe is learning again its own intellectual heritage. Europe will learn this and Europe will turn on the very people that preserved it for them and say that the people who preserved it for them have no culture and will keep up that lie to this very day. And you would read the intellectual history of the world without hearing the name Salamanca, the great university in Spain, or the great university in Africa, St. Corinne. These are the two universities 
that preserved the great culture of the medieval world that Europe would choose to forget and did forget but the most tragic of all it made you forget them and when they mentioned them to you you have no memory of it and the greatest crime committed against you was to destroy your confidence in your historical memory of what you have been so that you can forget what you are and also forget what you still can be. That's what it's all about. And this is why the European is referred to as the evil genius. In the game he started then, 500 years ago, he's still playing. If you look at the motion picture now, listen to what I'm saying. Now go back and look at the color purple and understand it now, based on what I'm just saying. You see a new motion picture. You see, you see the game he played. It was a war. That picture was not a motion picture. That picture was a part of a war against your mind. When they turn you on your men, when they turn you they don't want you to be anything with them once they destroy the effectiveness of the image of your men there's nothing they want you to be with them but a whore and a slut people. And that's what they're trying to achieve. To destroy a people totally. But they will recruit a people to help them do it and they are having some success in that recruitment. Now, Henry the Navigator's school is training Europe to move back see. Now we will have to deal with another neglected date in history. Not 1492, 1482. 1482, Europe, I mean Europeans came again along the coast of Ghana with under the leadership of Diaz Herrera, Portuguese. They wanted now to establish permanent fortifications. In the establishment of permanent fortifications, King Essa of Ghana tried to discourage them. He understood what was happening. And his famous speech is in a number of books, especially W.W. Claridge's two-volume work, A History of the Gold Coast and Ashanti. It's, in, in, it's again in J.C. DeGraff Johnson's African Glory. It's in a number of books. When he came along the coast, literally demanding to build permanent fortifications in Ghana, he discouraged it. He said that formerly you have come among us complaining about the weather, saying that we had no conditions under which you could live. Now you come in splendid attire. Now they will come all dressed up and saying they were sent by the gods. Now they're saying that they're coming to rule now. They want permanent fortification. And what did they want to build? Elmina Castle, the largest slave fortress in all Africa. I was there this summer. Elmina, the mine. They want the gold. They want the yellow gold and they want the black gold. 
slaves. And while he tried to discourage them, he wanted to engage in legitimate trade as before. He said, in that way, if we see each other infrequently, we can preserve our friendship. They wasn't buying it. And when he wouldn't buy the Bible story, they forced their way in, offshore, 500 troops. And in this, among these troops and sailors, a little known soldier, little known sailor, Christopher Colon. Later known, Christopher Columbus. Read Columbus's diary, and he says, as man and boy, I sailed up and down the Guinea coast for 23 years. What was Christopher Columbus doing up and down the Guinea coast for 23 years? He was in the early Portuguese slave trade. This man might be one of the biggest fakers and one of the biggest con men in history. <laughs> Why didn't he go to the East Indies with, with, with Isabella's money and Isabella's endorsement? Why did he go to the West Indies in the first place? What did he know about going to the West Indies? What did he learn about the West Indies? He learned from African sailors who had already gone to the West Indies. Then that's proof that African sailors had already gone to the West Indies. They told him how to pick up a sea curve. You pick up a sea curve someplace along the coast, you could, it would take you straight to the West Indies. You have to wait six months, it reverses itself and bring you back. And that's why ships were, were, were wrecked off the coast of Portugal on, on his way home. He may well have double-crossed Isabella. He double-crossed his sailors too. Because he, want, he made them sign a paper saying that he was in the East Indies and if they didn't sign it, he wanted to cut their tongues out. All of this is documented. Read Van Sertum as they came before Columbus. Read it again. Read it carefully. But there's a three-volume work also hard to get now. Africa... In the, dis in, in, the, in the discovery of America. Because there's other works on the subject. There's a whole small library of books dealing with the pre-Columbian presence of Africans in the New World. There's a new book coming out right now at the University of California. Christopher Columbus discovered absolutely nothing. <laughs> never set foot on North America or South America. He opened up North America, South America for European exploitation. But the great tragedy was the entry of 18, uh, of 1482. The building of Elmina Castle, the building in the beginning of permanent fortifications for Europeans. And another aspect of the slave trade forgotten was the entry of the Scandinavians and the entry of the Dutch. These shoe, wooden shoe wearing people <laughs> who so clean, grow two lips, who so clean they even named a cleanser after them, Dutch cleanser, one of the bloodiest, murderous slave traders that you can think about. So the coming of the Europeans was one of the disastrous acts of history. When people are telling you about their holocaust, all you have to say is that when you finish talking about your six million. I'll start my count with 60 million and I'm just starting my count. We talk about Holocaust the same as we talk about fish stories. Those who caught the biggest fish do the most talking. I was at Elmina, I was at Elmina Castle and I was at Gory Islands. 
Gory Island, one of the smaller of the, of the slave folks, 20 million just passed that one. They got 46 castles. 20 million passed through Gory. That was at Elmina, the biggest one. There's no counting of how many passed through Gory, passed through uh, Elmina. That's the monster. It, 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 it's first dungeon holds a thousand. This, this the dungeon for the women holds 500. Just for the women. That one compartment for the virgin girls that the, for the uh, ship's captains and the governors to pick their choice which one they want to read that night. That holds 250. So the coming of the Europeans, one of the great tragedies then in the history, in the history of the, of the whole world. Now the economy of Africa is getting the economy of Europe off the ground. Europe now is emerging from the tragedy of the Middle Ages, it's emerging people poor, resource poor, and land poor. It's emerging into the world and there is nothing for Europe to feed on within Europe. Europe has tried to enslave Europeans. It didn't work. Europe hasn't got, Europeans hasn't got the physical energy to bring it off. The Africans fortunately have the physical energy to bring it off. And still, and still have the physical energy. Europeans have treated Europeans so badly that when they try to enslave other Europeans to do the work, the Europeans can't bring it off physically. They cannot last. It does not mean that the Africans did not die wholesale. They did. But you had a reservoir to get more Africans. You just simply go back to the European reservoir. You've got another weakling. He didn't have enough strength to hold up under the pressure of this grueling, this grueling business. And it kept on and on. Nobody spared him and nobody showed him any mercy. All right, the business was around France, was around England, was around Portugal, and Spain. Spain. The British were kept out of the business, not out of any benevolence, because of an argument the British had with the Catholic Church. The French had some difference of opinion with the church and did not enter the business until that holy devil, Cardinal Rachelieu, gave France a rationale to get into the business. Then France got into the business. Someone gave Henry VIII's daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, a proposal for England's getting into the slave trade and she rejected it, then someone showed her how much profit could be made, then she accepted it. Then the lead ship in the British entry into the slave trade was her personal profit, the good ship Jesus. That was the name. Now among the female power brokers of Europe, Elizabeth stands out. But don't forget who she was and what she did. Europe had practically no great outstanding women power broker. 
And the one they did have was Elizabeth. She knew how to handle power. But in handling it, don't forget what she did to us and how she handled that power and how that power was directed. Finally, once the British broke clear of the Catholic Church, the British no longer had to secure what is called the Isientos, literally permission to engage in the trade. Now, the British went into the business with a vengeance. The British, led by Captain Hawkins, moved into the business with a vengeance. And when the British got into the business, it became a business. It was no longer sloppy. They drove the Portuguese out of West Africa. The Portuguese moved down to the Congo, subsequently Angola. And now the British pressured them. The French uh, moved in. The British said, show me the clause in Adam's will that says I'm not entitled to my share of this African gold. And the French said, who gave the Pope right to give away what wasn't his in the first place? Francis of France. Now everybody now was bidding for a share of Africa. Now Let's look at the Portuguese in the Congo. They came to the Congo ostensibly to establish a partnership. And the Africans, believing them, did establish a partnership. Finally, the Africans who had taken Portuguese names Adopted the religion, Portuguese customs, realized that the Portuguese were trying to take the Congo into a slave colony. Turned on the Portuguese and did a remarkable thing, remarkable in African history, remarkable in human history. Drove them out and established the Congo as a free country in the 1590s. And the Congo remained free from the 1590s until 1884. In the 1600s, a great king came to power. Shamba belonged on go. And from 1600, on next 20 years they not only threw away the Portuguese religion threw Portuguese cooking utensils into the sea <laughs> tore down the Portuguese churches went back and became purely African and had a golden age built again the Bashongo kingdom. There were two kingdoms, the kingdom of the Congo and Bashongo. And they came together now and brought that strength together, the eastern Congo and the Congo facing the sea. Well, the most remarkable thing, right in the midst of the slave trade and in spite of it, and all of this is forgotten. And yet it was well written about it. Ballinger's daily life in the kingdom of the Congo, but principally Torday's work on the trail of the Bashongo. No shortage of books about it. And yet it is unknown. 
The Portuguese moved to what is now Angola, faced a king who wasn't ready to fight them, and his sister kept holding his hands, hoping that he'd get ready. His sister in Zinga, because his sister held his hand, the Portuguese thought he was, she was for them. She was holding his hand until she could get ready. Because he didn't get ready in time, she just finally pushed him aside and got ready herself. She fought the Portuguese 52 of her 81 years, giving no quarter, asking no quarter. One of the greatest of the African warrior queens. She wanted, to, she was from a group called the Jajars. She wanted to stretch an empire across the southern belly of Africa. She became a Christian strategically, using it the way they use it. Strategically, for her purpose. Went to Portugal <coughs> for a treaty, saw people hungry. She said, you people don't live no Christianity. Why are these people doing hungry? What kind of Christians are you? <laughs> so we wouldn't permit this in our country. <laughs> she peeped that car. She knew they were liars. Then she put one against the other. She bought guns from the Portuguese and bought, bought guns from the Dutch and then some from the Finns. She manipulated them. Finally they tried to force her into a battle. She wasn't ready for it. And, and again they killed her sister and threw the mingled body of her sister at the palace door. Near the end of her life she was forced to fight a battle that she didn't want. It ended up being neither victory or defeat. But this woman kept the Portuguese from the hinterlands of Angola for most of her life and kept the slave trade from spreading into Angola. The last of the great monumental female warriors of this part of Africa. And yet, forgotten in history, but they know her. They know they met, they met a warrior. Always supported by men. She had three in her lifetime. I'm glad she had the kind she wanted. She, had, she generally married gopher type men who just did what they were told. And <laughs> didn't threaten her at all. <laughs> Jay Rogers uh, did a pretty good biography of her, but the best biography of her is written, uh, it was in French and it hadn't been translated, written by the Guin uh, young writer from Guinea, a personal friend of mine, Abraham Baby KK. But we need to, I, I did a long article well, in essence about five six years ago no about ten years ago now 75 that's 12 years oh god things go fast <coughs> but now in southern africa the dutch east india company needed a filling station and that filling station was really um found by, they needed a filling station for those stopping en route to India. The French Huguenots had been there before, others had been there before, but that was the reason Southern Africa was found and, and there were some dissident people in, in Holland, Calvinists. You have to understand the Calvinists were religious dissidents and who think that God uh, 
ordained them to look over the lesser breeds and they declared that Africans are lesser breeds. And many of the Jews who had been in Spain helped to establish the Dutch East India Company and, and own stock in the, the Dutch East India Company. And after the Portuguese were driven out of the Congo and were forced partly out of Angola, they came around to establish themselves in what is now Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Then they met the Arab slave trade moving down from the north and they established uh, a partnership with the Omani Arabs and they sold the, a lot of the slaves that went to Brazil were sold to the Portuguese by the Arabs. If you saw that fourth segment of the Africans when Alamazaroi rationalized the Arab slave trade and said there's only two, two million in the Arabian Peninsula and kept asking, where did these slaves go? He wouldn't dare ask that stupid question to somebody who knows the history. Many of these slaves went to India, some even went to China, but a lot of them were sold to the Portuguese and went to the New World. A lot of them, lot of them are in Brazil today because the slave, Arab slave trade uh, went into the millions. And um, it's not just two million. And if you read UNESCO documents too, you will see some good statistics on, on the Arab slave trade. But the brothers who belong to the faith uh, still hadn't been willing to do this because they have been willing to deal in depth with the, with the Arab slave trade. But the coming of the Europeans to East Africa uh, was met, met with the, uh, the Portuguese developed not only a slave trade in East Africa, but into a partnership with the Arab slave trade no, let's deal with North Africa because we want to deal with the coming of the Europeans to the total of Africa. In North Africa, then part of the Ottoman Empire of the Turks, the Europeans, the Turks were Europeans, but then the Turks were challenged by the French and the English. When the Turks were challenged by the French and the English, you see a new kind of colonialism being overlaid by that kind, one kind of colonialism challenging another kind of colonialism. Now you see competition between slave traders and slave traders, and Africans caught in a vice of history, caught in a vice of history and competition between traders and traders. And the European, the especially the, uh, the British controlling the business more and more. The absentee European now entering the business, you can now buy ships in the business without seeing the ships. You can buy plantations without seeing the plantations. You have slave stock on the British exchange. You've got the birth of lords of London gambling on the, on the exchange. Then you have the birth of something that's going to change the system. You have the U.S. that began to make a faster ship. And the U.S. Has be, that had been buying slaves from England and partly from the Portuguese, the U.S.
is now making its own ships and sending its ships directly to Africa. Now a competitor and a ruthless competitor has entered the slave trade. And the most, not only a ruthless competitor in, in the slave trade, but a person that would change the whole system of trading and the plantation system of the Caribbeans, this system is opening wider because formerly the proving ground for the slave system in the Western world, the Caribbean islands, but the dumping ground for the Portuguese trade was South America, principally Brazil. But Brazil was a resale point for South America, but the resale point for the United States was the Caribbean islands. With the U.S. challenging the British trade, the widening of the gap, the widening of the gap in the competition is now uh, becoming a thing, a world, a worldwide system. The main thing that we need to look at is that this system endorsed by the church was the first international economy that touched three continents and that out of this system came the basic commodity that laid the foundation for the modern technical capitalist world. And when you are naming, when you are making claims on the world, when you are making claims for reformation, when you are making claims for what is due you and your children in the world, your claims are too small. For they took away from you and drained away from you all the means that you could have had to have been nation, to have built empires, to have built schools, to have built Harvards, to have built Cambridges, to have built empires, to have built navies, and put you 500 years behind in technology but what they took away from us laid the basis for the modern technical world. And I remember in Washington a few months ago some German coming to a meeting came up to me sheepishly, halfway apologetically and said other immigrant groups in America pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Why haven't your race done the same thing? I lost my cool and said, because someone stole our boots, you bigger than SOB. When you look at the economy, when you look at the skyscrapers, when you look at all the diamonds people have, when you look at people flaunting Rolls Royces, 
If you look at the economy of the Western world, except for the slave trade, it might be there in some form, but it would not be there quite that way except for what they took from us. And you have to say that it belonged to me once in some way of a mission for our children is going to have to be to get it all back. Thank you.